Chantry teaches us that it is the hubris of men which brought the dark spawn into our world. Archers! So, Dragon Age Origins, it's back. And now it's called Origins. Can you just bring us up to speed on why the name change? Yeah, sure. I think with uh, one of the big things about the name Origins, there's really two parts to it. One is the origin stories, uh, which are really the lens through which you see the world. They're part of the game that's at the beginning of the game, and each is unique to each player, and then also how the world reflects on you in terms of the things that you do. These origin stories are just central to the experience. The other thing really is the return to the roots. I think this is one of the, probably the big message we want people to get from E3 is that, you know, Everyone's fond of the good old Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2 games that we've created a long time ago. This is really a return to that type of gaming. I'm assuming that because of the level of customization that you guys have talked about already, that that's why the dialogue it doesn't work the way that it does in, say, Mass Effect, where your character's dialogue is all voiced. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting issue uh, because there are so many choices that you have in dialogue. It's actually, you know, th they even depend. Like we actually are very dynamic with the dialogue choices depending on your origin story and who you are and stuff. So, and secondarily, there's also a lot more variety in who you can be in the game in terms of you know male, female, and other races and stuff. We'll give the details on that stuff. But again, you know, when you start multiplying that out, you start going, hmm, that's a, almost impossible to kind of calculate out. But that must have been a hard decision, having come off of Mass Effect, which did that so well and really created this, this cinematic, interactive experience. It was, it was definitely a big decision where we sat back and made the choice, you know, in the sense that, you know, we actually went through a whole big process involving ton of people in the studio, not just not just like a couple of folks in Dragon Age, but you know, everyone in the management team and all the, a lot of the other teams and, and thought a lot about it. And I think it, it just at the end of the day it seemed to fit the type of game we we're making. The things that the Bioware games have done in the past, especially in the Baldur's Gate series, has been really focus on your party and the interrelationships between them and between the player character. And so I'm wondering if the amount of customization options that you're going to allow, are you still going to be able to provide that kind of interaction between all of the characters and non-player characters? I can talk a little bit at a high level about the, the, the concept of the, the other players in your party. Uh, and I think, because they really do serve two purposes. No game um, sort of did tactical combat like Baldur's Gate. I think and even to this very day, it's still, still kind of like the pinnacle from our perspective of, of like, you know, the, the, the complicated chess match of wizard, like, you know, the spells going off and the traps and just everything to try and, like, manage that. Um, the other thing that's the, the really key thing that you noted is the, the value of other characters is they are, like, the mirror, you know, to the world. Like, I mean, I think the, you know, there's, there's a few comments they make during, even during the demo that are just kind of funny and entertaining and, you know, they're just, they're just there to liven things up. And I think secondarily, though, they, they do provide companionship and I think that's actually some of the most important thing that we probably the most important thing that we found them to do because it just reflects the story and makes the story more real otherwise you know you're you know it's hard for you to to really feel like you're part of the world but when you got these people that are literally traveling with you traveling with you yeah it adds a lot so um, how many characters can you have I think we saw up to four in the demo yeah, so it's four um, at, the, at a time in your party. There's, of course, a pool you can choose from. And for us, part of it ended up being like just the graphic fidelity want, we wanted to have is like, you know, it's a nice balance between like, you know, real good razzle dazzle effects with enough kind of pieces, chess pieces in a sense, to move and actually have meaningful tactical combat. So it wasn't, it wasn't dumbed down because of your experience um, building games for consoles in the past few years? No, it, it wasn't. I know that's been that's been obviously a fear that people have had is like these these bad console things have gotten into our head and we're like like ooh. But no, it it was actually it's, it's a sort of a balance point. Like it's kind of like an ease of manageability. I think the, the one of the challenges we had with 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 Baldur's Gate, I mean, we had some pretty big battles, but we're trying to have like larger sets of enemies. Like that's one of the big things. And, and secondarily, larger enemies themselves. So you probably saw the the ogre and and the impressive large creatures. So we're gonna actually be mixing it up a little more. So may I ask a somewhat um, imper uh, rude question. I don't know if it's rude. I don't know if it's rude. I can't think of the right word. <laughs> so I know you. I know. <laughs> I know. I know you built a new engine, and yeah. I guess the question is: Is that what's taking so long? Oh, that's that's actually that's a good question. One we've been very upfront with. I mean, what's taken so long is, is typically in BioWare's history, we kind of get started, announce the game, then show it at 4E3s while we were developing it. 
This time we decided let's just announce it, then not show it for the next four E3s, and then show it when it's you know nearing completion. And secondarily, what happened was we actually had a bit of a perspective shift, and not even a new one, but just said, hey, the good strategy for us, even while we're doing all these games, is kind of focus on one in the public eye at a time. So you know, like it was the Mass Effect year for like the last year, right? It's Mass Effect, Mass Effect, Mass Effect. Now we're onto the Dragon Age year. The plan will work, Your Majesty. Of course it will. The blight ends here. The RPG trend has seemed to be, except for Bioware, and well, to some degree Bioware as well, is, has been to simplify, simplify, simplify. You know, let's get rid of massive numbers of classes and race combinations. Even Dungeons and Dragons 4th Edition, you know, is a simplified version of Dungeons and Dragons from what we all remember growing up. So why is, so does Dragon Age, this return to its roots, is, is that the main reason is you're trying to return to your roots or are you just bucking the trend? How did that decision come about? I think it's at some level, you know, often often you're doing the right thing when you are bucking the trend because, you know, the, against, eventually the trend gets tedious. That's the other thing that's interesting about PC gaming is that I think PC gaming has has a typically a higher level detail and a higher level involvement. It's it's a little bit more of a relationship with the product. I mean, you look at things again like Sims. Look at like I think what Spore's going to do. Spore's going to be huge because, you know, we're already what 1.8 million creatures. That's just in a few, you know few weeks. I mean, it's, it, I think that's actually the difference is, 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 is where, you know, like the, a lot of console gaming, and hey, we make console games, but the, sometimes the relationship with the console game is a little more short, a little, a little more focused on like that just piece of entertainment, whereas PC is a longer term thing. For Ferelden! You mentioned in the demo that the blood is, stays on the armor and stuff, so um, how does that work? Does that Sort of, if they've had a night in the inn, are they clean the next day? Or <laughs> yeah, I think I think I think I think it's probably like you know, it's not it's not quite to the point where like the rain will wash it off. But I, I think I think I think I think it's simply you know you know how many things are you killing in a certain period of time is the density. But I think we're we're also reflecting the fact that our typical fan is is, is you know well past the M age and likes to play games that are that are engaging and, and maybe a bit cerebral in terms of your planning and thinking. At some level we're we're not we're not as excited about the, the very light kind of happy happy fantasy as we are about like the gritty more realistic like tougher kind of fantasy that we're doing in this game. Speaking of M your M audience, how far would you guys be willing to take the romantic relationships that you guys have sort of pioneered in gaming? It's not the kind of thing that most other developers even think to, even think to put in their games. You know, in many ways, the relationships within your party, which really do try and reflect realistic relationships, uh, and you know, it's something I think something we think is really important. I mean, I think that one of the problems with a lot of games is they just don't have the basis or the the foundation to like do that. It was, it was very funny in the first Baldur's Gate because, you know, we were we do I mean, we didn't do too much market research then, and it was just you just kind of would make it, and and we discovered like. If you ask people about, hey, is the romance thing like an important part of the game? They're, nah, no way. But that was like they totally loved it, and like people, and like you know, who was romancing who was like a big, huge deal to players. And we're very open to, to to portraying you know just realistic human relations and sometimes human elf relations and other and other things, right? So, so it, it's it's and aliens and and uh, you know, and it's just but it's, it's 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 I think the thing is it's interesting to explore those things. I think we're we like the medium because it gives us a chance to do that. Um. Have you guys talked about multiplayer at all? We actually, it's a single player game. It's a, it's a, it is a single player RPG. You're giving, you're giving the evil squint? <laughs> yeah, you really get the evil squint for that. Like, like, no multiplayer at all? Like, no LAN? No, there's, there's a multiplayer in this game. Like, it's a single player game. There's, I mean, the stuff. I'm leaving. <laughs> this, this interview's done. Really? No. I mean, playing Baldur's Gate 2 multiplayer LAN is, is one of the pinnacles of my gaming life, so... Um. Well, I think that the interesting, the interesting challenge of multiplayer, I mean, it is a challenge because you have to compromise stuff in the story, stuff in, in the interactions. I think that was the challenge. I mean, I think for us, we really said we want to make this game about you know your story, you being the hero and you being the focus. Yeah, and we know it's, it's a tough one because like, you, you get you get you get very emotional reactions to it. You get your reaction. I'm I'm choking back tears here. <laughs> and, you, and you get another reaction I had today was like they were like thank you so much. It's 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 it is in a sense it's a balancing of all these compromises. And I think that what you have to do is try and 
make the very best game for the best, you know, the, the, the people that love it. And I think that's that's really our goal. And it's, sometimes it doesn't quite turn out the way you want. Sometimes it does. Sometimes you exceed your expectations. So, Is there any chance this game would come to console? I mean, you know, I think the reality is, hey, we're, we're part of EA. EA is a very multi-platform um, company. But the other thing is we always make sure, and I think people saw this from Mass PC, is that we really, really do cater very carefully to the platform we build it for. Like we aren't just a, hey, just slap it broadly across a bunch of platforms and, hey, we're done. You know, that brings me to a question, you know, that we, uh, earlier today was the Sony press conference and Jack Trenton made the comment that consumers are moving away from the PC and into the living room. So given the timing of your game, how do you feel about that? You know, I think the real fundamental thing with the PC market is it's evolving, it's changing. Um, I, I wasn't aware that most like you know WoW players are playing from their living room, but they might be a lot of them. It's, it's quite possible. It's you know some of the some of the traditional gaming that was on the PC has moved to console, but then now meanwhile PC has evolved. I mean, you're getting much more connected games. You know, the reality is PC is, is is all about flexibility and connecting people, and you know there's there's reasons. You know, with with Dragon Age for example, we're going to have a tool set that we're going to be having. A lot, a lot of downloadable content. We'll talk about details with those later. But there's things that you know we want to create that kind of creates a community around the game, and that's you know it's it's very different than, than the console. And I think that's using the PC for its strengths. So you're basically in in disagreement. I disagree. <laughs>
an army in to fight my army and, and maybe I beat you back and you figure out, well, do I come in with more next time or do I change my units or do I tech up and things like that. And, and we've got all that in this game. It's a very kind of punch counter punch is the, the phrase we're using for it these days. And it's a, it's a fast paced game. You can get into heavy combat within the first two or three minutes. You can try to you know, protect your base and build some turrets and kind of uh, turtle up. Almost every unit in Halo Wars has a Y ability. Uh, the main combat is done from X, which is also where Justin can move the Marines around. And just movement is a very simple X command to move uh, versus the A to select. And then that's also your primary attack when you're over a target. We can blow up one of these, these uh, barrels here. Uh, but you also have a secondary attack with the Y button. In the case of the Marines, it's, it's uh, grenades. Uh, so we can pop back to the base here. Um, there's some hot keys to do that. You, know, you press left on the D-pad, it'll jump you between your bases. Uh, you can actually select uh, the barracks and show off one of the things that I know our fans have been waiting to find out what we're going to do with, which is the Spartan. We are set 20 years before the events of Halo 1, back when there actually were lots of Spartans around. And kind of befitting the Spartan role, there. Uh, they don't really exist inside the standard rock, paper, scissors relationship of the rest of the units. You know, we have tank speed infantry, infantry can shoot down planes, planes can bomb tanks. Mm -hmm. um, Spartans are sort of the kingmaker unit. They're, they can be good at any of those things. It's, it's how you choose to deploy them that really makes a difference. So we've got a couple of Spartans there and a couple of Scorpions selected. And it uh, looks like uh, maybe our allies getting attacked over there. So we can jump over there and see if we can do something to help him. So we've got some wraiths that come in, a little squad of grunts. Uh, the Spartan special ability, uh, we know the Spartans need to be the coolest unit in the game. They jack enemy vehicles. Uh, you just press Y on top of one of the wraiths here, and the Spartan will do a big old leap on it. And, okay. This is one of the things where we've really kind of overdone the things on purpose. It's over the top, it's hardcore. It's something that we, we want people to see. You see a backflip there. He ganks the elite out, and now I've taken over the wraith. Um, so now uh, my enemy is pretty sad. He's lost his wraith, but he's also, I, I've got one too. And the cool thing about this is it lets you go over pop and things like that. So if you're a hardcore guy, you know what that means, and how huge of an advantage that can be. There's a larger force coming over here. You can see some of the, the canonical Covenant units you would expect. Grunts and hunters. Hunters are great at killing vehicles, just like people would expect from the Halo franchise. Um, wraiths are, are pretty good, but the... I don't quite stand up to a scorpion. The wraiths have a cool plasma burn special ability, though. The, the Covenant grunts have things like sticky grenades. You know, all the things that the fans would expect. But again, kind of in that the primary, secondary nature that we've characterized everything. Um, so this is kind of a big force here. Maybe we can call in one of the carpet bombs from our Spirit of Fire. So we can pull up this, this simple circle menu. Justin can press A to, to anchor it, and then you, you drag the analog stick around to decide which, air, which direction you want your carpet bomb in. Some, some hardcore death and destruction there. Ca caught a few friendlies in that one, so you don't want to, want to do that too often. But um, it, it, that, that really kind of capsulizes Halo Wars in a nutshell. Um, we can do maybe a Mac, a Mac Blast on this other uh, group coming in. Uh, and so these are powers that you're asking the Spirit of Fire to, to call down for you. It's kind of, Mac is sort of like a sniper rifle, whereas uh, the carpet bomb is more like a grenade. So they have different strategic uses and things like that. So we have the units are all on the right side and the up upgrades are all on the left side. The Marines have one of the coolest upgrades. They can turn their grenades into rocket propelled grenades. Spartans have uh, also you know, many of the Arnold-like upgrades that you expect. They can go from the dual wheel to a chain gun mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually even the Spartan laser. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the bonuses that the Spartans confer upon the units they get in ties to the unit's level. Uh, it's a little bit hardcore, but uh, each unit has a level that's the summation of his veterancy and his upgrades. And so the Spartan then confers that upgrade, or that level, onto the unit he gets into. So if you have a level 5 Scorpion and you put a level 6 Spartan in it, now you have the level 11 Scorpion. If you don't spend time managing your battle and deploying those troops on the right things, you're going to get your, your butt handed to you pretty quickly. The, with the abilities that are attached to each unit, it reminds me a lot of the kind of micromanagement that was introduced in Warcraft 3, where even if you had a somewhat inferior force, you had to micromanage your units and you could still overcome somebody who wasn't really paying attention to their combat. Right, so uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was to bring dexterity to mm -hmm. strategy games. This is actually the battle-torn, nuclear war, or win winter-cleansed uh, harvest. Mm. So if you're familiar with uh, the lore and the canon, you know, that uh, the harvest is the, the farm world for the UNSC. 
and it was one of the actually where the first contact with the covenant was and they cleansed the crap out of it and blew it all up and so this is sort of after nuclear winter has set in and so justin's just built an elephant which if you've played halo 3 that's a, a nod to that uh, size wise ours is a little bit different in size just for scale but the elephant is captain cutter's unique unit uh, and it's kind of a mobile barracks. It can deploy itself here, and then we can train uh, Marines and Spartans and Flame Marines out of it. Can you use the sniper tower? Uh, yeah, actually, Justin can pop in that. And so the sniper towers give them a huge combat advantage. So we, we down that elite in no time flat once we're yeah. up there. Yeah. So you know, like a strategy game, uh, game would expect there are lots of ways to invest in areas around the map. We didn't exactly specifically mention it yet, but there is a single resource in Halo Wars mm. called Supplies. Yeah, ensemble fans are probably freaking out when they hear that. <laughs> you know, our, our games have always had really robust economies. So kind of one of the hallmarks for a PC RTS anyway is that there's always an ability to add more onto it. Have you guys made any plans for downloadable content to expand the universe? Uh, we did, actually. I would be beheaded if I talked about them. <laughs> um, so Justin's uh, taking control here of the Forerunner Supply Elevator, or <coughs> otherwise affectionately known as the Supply Pooper. Uh, and it'll spit out supplies, and so this is an area where I can I can you know, deploy my Marines in the sniper towers and try to hold it. But this is a pretty contested area on the map because it's free supplies. Mm -hmm. And so one strategy is to run over there quickly, take out the, the bad guys guarding it, and take control of that and, and maybe not build any supply pads in your base. That's also pretty risky because if you lose that, you know, you're you're, out, you're going to be out of the game. But you know, we want those 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 choices in the, in the game. And, um, getting that that map investment in the in the game is huge for a strategy game. And those types of special little map specific things are, are on each map that you have. So we're playing against the uh, Prophet of Regret here. He's one of the Covenant leaders. Um, and so we have the mini map. We have your population, your tech level, your resources. The UI up in the upper left hand corner is not normally there. We added it for E3 so people could play the game. And, uh, so when uh, when Halo first came out, it was it wasn't the first FPS that was ever on a console, right. but it certainly defined the control scheme for what came afterward. Exactly. And uh, so is that the same type of thing that you're trying to do for RTS on console? Do you see people? looking at Halo Wars and then thinking to themselves, well, this, I want to make an RTS on a console, I'm going to copy this control scheme. Um, I would, sure. I think, <laughs> yeah, it's, how, how would we not want that? It, we certainly, I think, still think of RTS on the, on the console as an untapped genre. Right. So now our profit's been upgraded, he's got some cool things going on too. He'll probably bring down the cleansing beam here shortly. Oh, so there's the cleansing beam. This is what the Covenant have used to glass the planet. Uh, if you're familiar with the lore. So they're using it to glass our army, which uh, Justin is obliging all too readily. <laughs> uh, that also can be upgraded. Um, this is the, the early version. You can upgrade it to something that's even much more cataclysmic than that. Do mm. you think you'd be able to come back from this one, Justin? I don't think so. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I, I can guarantee you the balance guys are not going to let him move it down. <laughs> <laughs>